Good morning. I'm going to officially call our meeting to order. And the first thing that we're going to do is establish a quorum. So we're going to do roll call starting at my right. Holly Cardenas, industry member. Joseph Federico, industry member. Lisa Tong, public member. Rich Hedges, public member. Dr. Carrie Williams, public member. Andrew Drafton, public member. Jackie Crabtree, industry member. Coco Lachine, public member. Okay, so we've established a quorum. And the next item on our agenda is our my opening remarks. I would like to thank everyone um, for coming out. I would specifically like to acknowledge our Director of Consumer Affairs, Mr. Dean Grafilo, for attending our meeting today. Um, today, my remarks are specifically directed toward Mr. Richard Hedges. Um, this is going to be his last official board meeting with us. And so I would like to first just thank Mr. Hedges. I think the reputation of our board as being so collegial is in large part due to Mr. Hedges. I will say that from me being appointed to the board four years ago, he welcomed me with open arms. And it's the foundation that he set, how he interacts with every member of this board, how he makes himself available, how he works really hard, how he sacrifices his time, that has set an example for me that I hope that we can continue to carry on after today. Um, how well that I'm able to conduct myself in DRC hearings, how knowledgeable I am, it's large in part due to Mr. Hedges. So I would like to personally thank you for your service, for caring, for sharing who you are in your lives with us. You know, I, I enjoy receiving your Christmas cards every year. And I think, again, that that collegiality, that feeling that we're able to work together and that we're almost like family is because of that example that Mr. Hedges sets with sharing a piece of him with all of us, even outside of board member matters. So I would like to personally thank you. And what we're going to do is officially present Mr. Hedges. The California Department of Consumer Affairs would like to honor Richard Hedges upon the ending of his term as a board member. Whereas Richard Hedges has been a public board member for the Board of Barbering and Cosmetology for more than 14 years. And whereas Mr. Hedges, while on the board, has served on the following committees, disciplinary review, education and outreach, enforcement and inspections, health and safety advisory, licensing and examination, legislative and budget, and the medical services task force. And whereas Mr. Hedges has earned the trust, respect, and friendship of all who have worked with him, now, therefore be it resolved that Director Dean R. Grafillo, and, behalf, and on behalf of the Board of Barbering and Cosmetology, does hereby honor Richard Hedges for his many years of public participation, thanking him for his tireless efforts on behalf of not only the Board of Barbering and Cosmetology, but the state of California, and extends best wishes, best wishes for success and fulfillment in all his endeavors. And be it further resolved that a suitably prepared copy of this resolution be presented to Richard Hedges. And it has been signed by our director, Mr. Dean Grafillo, who is still here. He would like to stand so we can honor you as we honor Mr. Hedges for his service with the Board of Barbering. hearing where he was horribly insulted. <clears throat> and I made up my mind at that time that there had to be some changes. And as we face sunset, uh, based on the activities of our officers, I knew Liz Figueroa. She grew up down the street from me, and she was the uh, 
chair of the Business and Professions Committee. In the, in the aisle, she led me to believe that if we remove the current officers, they may not sunset the board. So I asked Christy, brand new, <laughs> to put on the next agenda an item for reconsideration of the officers, which is a parliamentary move that anyone who's voted in favor of an officer can do to reconsider the officer. Well, Christy was slammed. I was threatened. Uh, there was allegations that there were bagley Keen Act violations that we had colluded to do that. And that's not true. And it wasn't true. And nothing was upheld. And we were able, uh, based on the evidence, we, we removed the officers and we're off to a new ball game. Uh, the only time we were actually sunsetted was an accident. <laughs> <laughs> where Schwarzenegger and the, and the, and the assembly were at differences on getting uh, some of the some of the uh, boards uh, redone uh, and not sunsetted, and they forgot the markup on the last day. Five boards, ours was one of them, which is why I'm still here, because it erased my first two terms. <laughs> so it was a gift to me. And so uh, I, really, I really have tried to make this a collegial board, but it's not been me alone. We've had wonderful board members. I mean, the legislature and the governor have really done their jobs in order to, uh, to bring on good board members. And it wasn't just uh, uh, the Democrats. Uh, Frank Lloyd, who's a conservative Republican, and I became allies. That was the one other board member I always talked to about issues. And uh, we ran the DRC for years by ourselves because, quite frankly, people who are appointed usually have job, real jobs to take two or three, or sometimes we had to be able to four days off. It was impossible for them. So, uh, I think the one thing that I want to see monitored very closely is the apprenticeship program. For kids like me who are poor, that this is a vehicle for them to get us. <clears throat> for the, them to get skills that are, that, that if they also have the gift of gab and other things that go with uh, running a barbershop or, uh, or, or whatever they choose to do within the industry, uh, it works really, really well for them and they can earn money and sustain themselves during that period. Unfortunately, we've seen schools who do not do their paperwork, they get in trouble for no fault of their own. We've actually had <coughs> five young undocumented men testify under oath that they were paying $3,000 to get a social security number from one of those schools. Since we have no oversight of the schools, there's not much we can do about it. So that's another issue for hope changes. And uh, so, again, trying to improve the apprenticeship program and extend it to many, many people. Because if you believe the literature that's out there, with, from Al Gore to Stephen Levy, who's a conservative Republican, we're going to lose two billion jobs in the world in the next 20 years through automation. And so we have to get young people, both lower economic and higher economic good skills. And this industry is one of the ways to do it. So I think I've said enough and held the meeting up long enough, but I really appreciate this, and I've really been touched by it. Thank you. I would also like to take a moment to have our legal counsel introduce himself. We have our um, legal counsel, Ms. Rebecca Bond, and we have a new legal counsel, I believe, who will be substituting in her place for a period of time. So just a brief introduction. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, again, Rebecca Bond, and then I bring with me Selwood Bojack. She's uh, newer to our office, and, um, and we hope you and she can be here. Great. As Rebecca said, Solwa Bojack, it's nice to meet you. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. So now we're going to move to the next item on our agenda, which is general public comment. And this public comment is for items that are not currently on the agenda. So we open up the floor for any public comment. With the uh, board's indulgence, Fred Jones, Professional Beauty Federation of California. I won't take a whole lot of time either. Um, but I think there's only three of us in this room that were here 14 years ago <laughs> uh, when you were appointed. Um, and... The board was one of the most difficult boards in DCA. In fact, uh, the then director 
would send Rebecca's boss down, Dorothea Johnson, to our board member at meetings to actually threaten the board with personal liability <laughs> if they continued to do the things that they were doing. Um, it was ugly, to put it mildly. And uh, I sent a personal email to Rich over the weekend uh, when I learned the news of his departure. And I told him in the email, and I'll tell him publicly, that he was single-handedly responsible for turning the board around. It was basically a 5-4 split board. And he was with, um, at the time, the folks that were going off the reservation, as it were. And when he saw uh, in public what they were doing, he realized this can't stand. And he was the deciding vote that switched that 5-4 the other direction. And from that moment <coughs> forward, <clears throat> the board has had totally changed. Over the course of time, when some of those other members were replaced and new members brought in, Dr. Carey, you're exactly right. Rich set a new tone for this board. Um, and so for the last decade plus, I think it's become one of the most well-run um, boards or bureaus within the Department of Consumer Affairs. So it's from the worst <laughs> to the best. is pretty darn impressive. And uh, at least for me, I believe the two people most responsible for that is Richard Hedges and Christy Underwood. So, thank you, Richard, for your I service. Done it without Indeed. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jean Ogren from the Electrology Association, and as Christy knows, I've probably been around longest. <laughs> but uh, since I started electrolysis when I was 18, and I worked for 45 years. Um, but I do remember this board when it was very ugly and very unprofessional. And it is so nice over the years to see changes. And um, I'm sure Mr. Hedges, well, of course, he's from San Mateo, and so am I. So he's got to be really good. <laughs> but it has been a pleasure to see um, the board change and um, be much more professional and, and get things done. And so I have appreciated um his service to this board. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Jamie Schraubeck, Precision Nails. I've only been coming for 10 years, just shortly after Christy took over. And then, Richard, I've appreciated everything you've done since. So thank you. And I appreciate even now that you're talking about looking to the future of the industry and the consumer protection that we need. And with that in mind, I would ask that we create either a task force or an ongoing um, report to the board about new trends, techniques, education, devices and equipment, business practices that are coming to the industry that I would rather have you be aware of before it becomes an enforcement issue. I think that having those of us who are keeping our eyes and ears open and being able to share that with you um, to the staff so that they could do their research and then present it to you in a board meeting would be really helpful in terms of your planning for regulations and enforcement activities. Thank you. Do we have any additional public comment? OK, seeing none, I'm now going to transition into our executive officer's report from Ms. Christy Underwood. Well, you know I can't follow that. <laughs> Um, very quickly, I would like to personally thank Richard. He's been like probably the closest thing as a family member is what I can say about Richard to me. So we have been through thick and thin, and I know we'll stay in touch, so I won't say I'll miss you. Um, so going to agenda item number four, um, your statistics are included, and so um, a uh, couple things I did want to mention is that we are working to pull together um, a multi-year report on examination pass-fail rates. That's something we talked about in the past. So that is data that we are still working on formulating so that we can see, you can have a comparison because right now we've just showed you the current examination results. So hopefully by our next board meeting we will have more extensive um, history to show you on that as well. Um, 
as for that, there's nothing out, um, out of the ordinary in our statistics. So if you want to take a look at your agenda packets, and I can answer any questions. Just one couple things on the examination uh, results. Um, just a, a ter clerical error, I think, on the Korean uh, written exam for the barber. Uh, there's one passed and two failed, uh, three total, yeah. with a zero percent. Should be. 33.333. And then on the Spanish uh, for the cosmetologist, uh, it seems that we've actually gotten the pass rates up uh, in some of the other fields. But uh, for some reason, the cosmetology, right. it's the hardest test, is still 30%. And again, I will say that if your grammar is bad, or non-existent, it's hard to learn a new language in the written form, even though conversationally it may be easier. So somehow, maybe in the Spanish-speaking schools, we need to put a little more force in. There's got to be something to help these folks pass the test. Uh, I had a Spanish teacher that told me that, that the most likely people to fail Spanish one So that's part of what I'm basing it on. Dr. Wynn. Uh, I just have questions on the licenses issued in the last five years. It seems fiscal year 16, 17 dropped considerably. If we look back to the last three, it seems like there is an attrition of like 30% from 14, fiscal year 14, and fiscal year 15 was about 20%. It seems to be going on to any venture on a guess on what, why that might be? Well, I have a guess. Um, I would guess that it could be most recently because of the Marinello situation. That was a lot of schools that closed, and we definitely saw internally a decrease in our applications coming in. Thank you. Are there any additional questions about our statistics? Kids that were in your term, do we know what private school site parents been doing to try to help them? Um, well, when when Marinello's closed, private post secondary actually sent out teams of people to locations. So I do think that the bureau at that time did, and they worked with us on that as well. So I think they they did a good job at connecting with those students. Um, I hope maybe the students are going to get back into schools, and I know some did. Um, but it, it, from just purely based on our application intake, because that's really the only data we have, it definitely seemed to, to decrease when, when all those schools closed down. Well, when the Paul Mitchell school just sort of evaporated in San Mateo one day, it was open, the next day it was closed, I got a lot of local calls uh, from parents. Uh, I haven't gotten any calls in this year. Right. Just to add on to that, and also with the Marinello school closure, um, since the schools were closed, the students were given the choice that basically if they continue not to choose the program or continue in that program, that their loans were ultimately forgiven. Mm -hmm. So that might have been, the, that their student loans might have been forgiven. So some students maybe, we thought about that, where then if they wished to, to transfer to another school and pick back up where they left off, mm -hmm. their loans were still like being held viable against the student. So, I mean, they've kind of, when the school closed down, some of those students were basically given that second choice, to, second chance to make to make the choice again, and so some of them might not have chosen to go through that fashion. Okay, are there any additional questions about our statistics? Okay, seeing none, we're now going to move on to item number five, the approval of our board meeting minutes. We have three different um, meetings that we had to have for our last board meeting on January 22nd. April 24th and May 15th of 2017. I'd like to make a motion. Okay. That all three of the minutes be approved under one motion and I make that motion. Second. Okay, seeing that there is a motion and a second, I will now call for a vote. And we'll start at my right. Oh, do we need public comment on the minutes? Technically, we have to call. 
before I call for the vote for the approval of the minutes. So is there any public comment regarding the minutes? Yes. Hi there, Wendy, California Aesthetic Alliance. Um, in the January meeting from last um, January, it, uh, we were discussing the keratin lash lifts, and there is a typo in there that we are trying to curl lips. Okay, <laughs> just wanted to make sure that we're not trying to curl lips, trying to curl <laughs> lashes. That's but <laughs> yes, that is out of scope, definitely, and I just wanted to point that out because it's an old proofreading thing I have. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there any additional public comments about the board minute, minutes in your packet? Okay, seeing none, now I will call for a vote starting at my right. Holly Cornes, yes. Just Federico, yes. Lisa Tong, yes. Rich Hedges, yes. Dr. Carrie Williams, yes. Andrew Grafkin, yes. Jackie Grafkin, yes. Coco Lachine, yes. Okay, so it passes and we'll move on to item number six, which is establishing the manicures hair removal task force. And I will defer to Christy on this one. So in your packet is, um, this is related to SB 296, which um, we will also discuss later. Um, and that is the bill by Senator Wynn asking us to look at increasing the manicure scope of practice to include waxing. Um, so this, what the bill has been made a two-year bill and the senator along with Senator Hill um, who's the chair of the Business and Professions Committee, has sent us a letter, which is included in your packet, asking us to establish a task force to look at increasing the manicuring um, scope of practice to include this process. So in the memo that's provided is what action would need to be required by the board, um, the different steps to actually set up this task force. Um, so if you look at the memo, we would want the board to determine if board members should be present on the task force, and if so, we would need that to volunteers and that to be voted on. And then we've proposed a compilation of what the members um, of the task force would be, which would be one manicurist, one esthetician, one cosmetologist, two educators, one waxing industry representative, an association representative, the executive officer, our project manager, and our outreach analyst. Um, so that's what we propose, but of course it's up to the board. Um, and then if the following terms are acceptable, that the task force membership is not considered employment with the state, and that members serve on a voluntary basis and don't receive salary, benefits, or travel reimbursement, um, with the exception, of course, of members and staff, board members and staff. And that we would like to um, have this meeting on September 18th, 2017. Um, we want to make sure that it's clear that the directive of this task force is to provide direction on staff on how they would like to accommodate Senator Wynn's request, which is specific in her letter, which is to look at increasing the educational requirements. And then, did I get everything? And, I, and that, that would be it. So starting at the top, we could get, take it to determine what the board would like to do. This just came to me. I should have thought about it crossover from manicures to esthetician. Yeah. That might be one of the ways to do it, instead of adding hours on the manicures. So what we need to do is first decide if board members are going to be a part of the task force. Right, Christy? I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So board members. How do we feel about actually knowing that this task force is going to be important for us to decide um, how we should move forward with having um, manicures or if they should be allowed to include waxing within their scope of practice? Do board members want to be a part of this task force? I would like to be a part of the task yes, force. I, was going to say, I think some, we should have some board members a part of the task force. I cannot imagine that the board would want to be part of anything where you're going to have the responsibility for fulfilling it. Mm -hmm. So knowing that we agree that there should be board members part of this task force, um, Mr. Federico has already stated that he would like to be a part of the task force. Are there any additional members on the board who would like to participate in the task force? <clears throat> what is the commitment to uh, the obligation for uh, time on this? How often will they? We have to report. We have to report to the back to the Senate um, by the end of the year. So we're, we're looking at probably a one-day meeting, hammering it out, and 
potentially, if needed, an, an additional meeting. And both would be held here in Sacramento. So about two meetings. At the most. But I would need to attend uh, out and about for this task force. We're just holding meetings for it. I'm just, for time commitment. Right. It would be, we would hold a meeting um, here, here. Yeah. Okay, then I would, I would be a part of it. So we have two board members who have committed to participating in the Manicures Hair Removal Task Force. Um, any additional members interested? Okay, I think, oh, we have one we can't show. Just the two. So those will be our two board members. We've established that. And board members, the requests or suggestions that have been posed to us regarding what the committee should consist of, um, I think um, that I was just going to point out since one of the um, charges is, is prioritizing public health and well-being, we'd like to see a, a someone who is like a public member or someone from the public to look out for their interests. And maybe I would propose a, like a board member emeritus or something like that to not be interested in it. <laughs> 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 so is there a lot of screaming going on? <laughs> That's an inside joke. Um, I do agree, looking at the current compilation as far as the suggestion that there are, um, that a representative of the public should be a part of the committee. And if we can charge, um, knowing that, I mean, I also agree if this kind of going down to allowing our executive officer, Ms. Christy Underwood, to delegate the members, that that could just be taken into consideration. And this is going to, will this be an open hearing room, correct? That we, yes. When we have the task force. <laughs> so we will encourage members of the public to show oh, yeah. up. Absolutely, yes, it yeah. will be held open. Okay, okay. So it'll be publicly noticed, it'll go out to our interested parties, the whole bit. Okay, so going over the rest of the suggestions that our staff has given us, are, are there any additional questions, um, additions, subtractions before we make a motion? Okay, so. So just to clarify okay. that your motion could be um, to accept the recommendations from staff by adding um, a public member to the number two and um, that we have two volunteers from our board and then accepting all the other items as part of your motion. So moved. I'll second it. Okay. Can I just ask a yeah. clarification question? Who gets to, who decides on these representatives if there's more than one from? Oh, um, listen. Evidently me. <laughs> Christy. Okay, just to clarify. So maybe we need to clarify the motion. It's, it is, um, that would be under number five. Five? Item five. Oh, sorry. So we currently have a motion on the floor. I'm now going to open it up for public comment. Hi there, Wendy Jacobs, California Aesthetic Alliance. Um, as some of you know, um, we've obtained uh, just about 1,500 signatures from your licensees most of which are estheticians, um, some that are Cosmo crossover, some that are, um, are uh, dually licensed as manicurists. And uh, the sentiment that we have in this public um, petition that you can find on change.org that has been forwarded to the board and also to uh, Mr. Garofalo's office um, is overwhelmingly that this is going to be a great issue in the public. And we hope that you understand as a board that if I were to read um, Chapter 10, Barbering and Cosmetology, Article Number 1, Administration 7303.1, Priority of the Board, Protection of the Public. Protection of the public shall be the highest priority for the Board of Barbering and Cosmetology in exercising its licensing, regulatory, and disciplinary functions. Whenever the protection of the public is inconsistent with other interests sought out to be promoted, the protection of the public shall be paramount. Additionally, in Mr. Graflow's statement in his um, DCA strategy going into 2020, 
He says, or whoever's writing this, of course, DCA protects and serves the consumer in many ways, including supporting and advocating for consumer interests before the lawmakers. DCA staff shall review, analyze proposed legislations and regulations to ensure that consumers are protected. This bill is incredibly dangerous. And I speak for many of my clients, for one of my personal friends that spent over two years explaining her reconstructive surgery to a board of her peers and attorneys and gynecologists and everybody else because she went to a nail salon, thought she was getting a heck of a deal because it was a nail salon. The owners were licensed, the practitioners were not, and she spent two years having her whole uh, below the waistline exposed to the public. And I can share that because she's, she's actually a constituent in, in Senator Wynn's area. She's in Huntington Beach. The nail shop was in Dana Point, and this is a really serious thing because a $35 Brazilian is going to happen. You won't be seeing waxing happening out on the floor and making sure that these practices are safe. They will go into the back rooms where they will allegedly only work from the knee down or on the face only, and these things are going to happen. And I can't express to you how passionate your estheticians, your licensees are that this sort of education could go and this, if this bill enacts, it's just legitimizing all the illegal activity that's been happening. We all know it happens. We see the results. You see the complaints. You know that waxing is the biggest threat to public health as far as our fines and things like that go. And I just can't be more passionate about this. Um, on behalf of over 3,000 members of your licensees, I really, really want to express how important this is. This does not go forward. So, thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional public comments? Seeing none, I will now call a vote. This time I'll start to my left. Coco uh, yes. Jackie Crabtree, yes. Andrew Drapkin, yes. Dr. Carrie Williams, yes. Rich Hedges, public member, yes. Lisa Tom, yes. Joseph Federico, uh, yes. Holly Corden, yes, yes. Okay, so the motion passes. We look forward to having our task force formed. We can get some things done. The next item on the agenda is item number seven. We're going to now hear our report from our enforcement committee. So I'm going to defer to our, should it be the, the new chair? The new chair. So yesterday we had an enforcement committee hearing, and primarily the, um, the, main, the main issue that we took up in the enforcement committee hearing was to try and uh, attempt to restructure our um, disciplinary review committee uh, because we had ran into some, I would say, um, administrative difficulties, right? In, re in regards to um, how, how it's currently being organized. So the ultimate takeaway um, that, the, that we decided in our um, enforcement, and in, uh, excuse me, in our enforcement inspections committee is that we will devise a new disciplinary review committee one where instead of um, the entire disciplinary review committee being, um, or uh, instead of entire being um, populated by board members, there will just be a single board member with um, a with uh, two other individuals um, that um, yeah, that with uh, two other individuals that necessarily don't need to be a board member, but they could be previous board members. Yeah, I'm gonna please go to Christy on that. So, um, the proposal is to have that the board can establish multiple DRC committees. That's it. Um, each committee will be three people, three individuals. Um, each committee shall include at least one member of the barbering and cosmetology industry, one member who is not associated professionally or financially with that industry, and then one 
board member. Um, each member of a disciplinary review committee may be removed before the end of his or her term by a majority vote of the board. And each committee shall meet as deemed necessary by the board. Each committee member shall be paid a per diem pursuant to section 103 of the Business and Professions Code and shall be reimbursed for any travel expense. So this is um, what the committee agreed on yesterday and is proposing to the board today. If the board chooses to approve this proposed regulatory language, we will start the regulatory process, which of course will take some some quite some time. So it, it's it, you'll. You'll all be seeing this many more times to come, um, but the approval of the board today would allow us to start the regulatory process. Yes. So we hammered this out over a period of time yesterday. The people that were in the public yesterday are here today, or most of them are now. And uh, uh, this really started in January when the board, and by the way, I went back and reviewed the January meeting on television last night. So I always do that to make sure that I understand the minutes. So uh, there was really a rejection of the idea that no board members would be on it because those of us that have been in, in sunset hearings know that we are very responsible for it and issues come up regarding the DRC and to take it completely out of the board's hands so that they would not be able to review it through a board member would be a big mistake. And, and everybody's opinion discussed it yesterday and I think it's pretty much the consensus in January. So the big, one big change in the policy that was brought to us or the, the proposed uh, regulations that was brought to us was that we added the board member. So there will be at least one board member. Yes, one board member. And will there at least be one board member knowing that several committees can be created on each committee? Okay. Yes, so what, we, what the committee is now asking is just for approval of this um, steps. I would move approval. I second. Question. I'm not sure how this call got started. Is it because we wanted more uh, public participation or is it because of a uh, staffing problem sometimes uh, at the DRC board? Yeah, I think it's because members aren't available to attend, so it's creating difficulty. At least two people have to, I mean, please correct me if I'm wrong, Tracy, at least two people have to be at the DRC, so the attendance of board members at DRC is starting to make it difficult. Had, had, uh, uh, this is just a suggestion, uh, is that my suggestion would be keeping the current setup, but we create a, uh, a poll of alternate members that are not board members. That was only one of the reasons why we needed to restructure the board. In addition, there was an addition, um, uh, a, another primary reason that was um, given to us um, from our legal counsel, which is in regards to, as we see, as these cases kind of get kicked up the chain and go past DRC and end up going into like the AG's office, once the AG, uh, once um, once everything gets settled down, that gets sent back to the board for final approval, and we get our mail votes. The, it becomes um, the the difficulty or the the conflict becomes when someone who already sat through a DRC hearing and heard the testimony be given comes back and sees the same case again, they may be privy to additional knowledge that everyone else on the board wasn't privy to at that point in time. So by removing the three board members that who are sitting, or however we have, who sit in front of DRC and only placing the one person who would then be removed from the final mail vote call, we're basically trying to, uh, to reinstill the integrity and making sure that, there's, that there can't be any conflicts. If that makes sense. Somewhat. Yes, yeah, somewhat. It sounded better when the lawyer said it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I tried my best. Good job. <laughs> so, actually, Coco, I, I feel the same way you do in many ways. Uh, but, quite frankly, with me, you know, off the DRC, we only have one person that's actually solidly for Riverside. And so, uh, we've got. I think Joe's going to try to figure out how to get his schedule so he can get down there. But uh, I understand the need to be able to staff it. Number one, and number two, I understand the concept under the Brown Act, which is somewhat different, but not very much different than the Bagley Keene Act. I have a friend on the city council who was on the planning commission when an issue came up, and the city attorney asked him to recuse himself because he'd already seen the issue and and 
actually forcefully feel an opinion. So he had prejudged it before the city council saw it. So he recused himself from the voting. Um, he may have been able to get away with it, but it was. But it was the problem was that that if a court action took place, it might cause problems down the road. And I think what this is trying to do more than anything else, Christy, correct me if I'm wrong, is to try to avoid future problems. So even though I like the old system, I'm grudgingly going along with the new system. I just wanted to um, ask a question. Since we did make a few small changes to the text, I don't know if that's reflected in the motion or if it needs to be, because we made some um, adjustments to the language yesterday at the enforcement committee meeting. Right, so what's being presented to the board today is the, the language as, that you see in your packet under the board meeting today. Under B, it would read, each committee shall include at least one member of the board in barbering and cosmetology industry, one member who is not associated professionally or financially with that industry, and one board member. So that's the change. And then at, and under D, this, the very last sentence would end after travel expenses. So we would remove according to the policies of the Department of Consumer Affairs and the laws of the state. That was based on recommendation of the attorney. Right. And can I further clarify on subsection B? Uh, Sounds like these are always, according to sub A, three member <coughs> committees, correct? Right. So, <clears throat> would it be more accurate to say each committee, uh, B, each committee shall consist of one board member, one this, one that, as opposed to at least one? Because, in other words, you, there's only there's only three spots. Um, that, from yesterday, we wanted to keep the at least one, and so that we could potentially have four. But the very Previous that subsection says three. So unless you want to alter that language, why? It says yeah. it shall be composed of three right. members. Well, the city That's right. have four employees in case there was someone that couldn't make it. No, we had discussed that because it states multiple committees, we would have multiple committees for. Yeah, we could have 27. Is that combination? Yeah, exactly. Just assign one. Oh, right. Or, or, if, or if only like two that. showed up. Or if we could only get two for that meeting. Right. Then you wouldn't want to say at least one of each of these things, right? Because then if only three, two people are there. So I'm trying to think how much can be resolved sort of at a drafting level. But, um, but you'd want your language to reflect all of that. You'd want your language to make it clear. Um, you're, you're talking about maybe alternates or different versions of the same committee in different areas so that each one of those versions has these three types of members. Right. Um, we thought multiple committees would have to have at least that three makeup. Right. Okay, so according to this language, there's <coughs> one committee of three. Oh, and then there's multiple disciplinary review right. committees. And each of those would consist of each of those three things, right? right? Not as okay. Again, I, I don't think it would be at least one because you're. I, it sounds like what the board is trying to achieve is to have one of each, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> we still have a motion on the floor. Well, oh, was this properly clarified that that motion? Because uh, as I heard the motion, you were approving the language presented to you today. So it needs to be adjusted. I think you 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 want to clarify. Mm -hmm. Maybe, Sounds like maybe you want to have a discussion with the attorney that, that gave us this language yesterday. No, I don't think that communication is necessary at this stage. I think what your motion needs to reflect is if you intend to incorporate the changes that your board member points out were made yesterday at committee level. So in other words, that could require a, an amendment to the motion to at least incorporate what she had referred to, uh, whether or not the language I was referring to helps uh, clarify what you're looking for or not. Like in your motion as well. The reason I made that comment is that this was hammered out with the attorney yesterday. Oh, I understand. We spoke. To, to clarify, my question was because when we made the motion, the changes were not brought up in today's meeting. Mm -hmm. Just yet. So, so. so the motion should be amended to just include the changes that were discussed in the committee meeting. And I, I accept that. So should we restate the motion? Or you can, you can do that, or okay. if your second also supports the amendment, then I think 
Okay, so I think Ms. Crabtree seconded Ms. Pritchard's original motion. Mm -hmm. So we're, just to clarify, we're amending the motion to include um, changes in the language that were discussed in the enforcement committee meeting. Which are? Which are? I will say. Okay. <laughs> um, changing to B, we're moving and, and adding at the end, and one board member. And F on D, um, the sentence would end after travel expenses and according to the policies of the Department of Consumer Affairs and laws of the state would be removed. That's what the committee recommends. Okay, so Ms. Crabtree, as our second, do you adopt the changes as well? I do. Okay, so now we have an amended motion on the floor. Is there any public comment? Seeing no public comment, I will call for a vote starting at my right. Colin Cardenas, yes. Just Federico, yes. Lisa Tong, yes. Rich Hedges, yes. Dr. Carrie Williams, yes. Dr. Drafkin, yes. Jackie Crabtree, yes. Coco Lachita, I'm abstaining. Okay. So the motion passes, and yes, Mr. Hedges. So one thing I'd like to point out on this motion, and I think the reason we didn't have a lot of public comment, is the changes in this almost directly reflect the public comment from January. And that means the board is listening to the public. Okay, great. So now we're going to move. Now we're going to move forward with item number five, which is the report from our chairperson from our legislative and budget committee report. Our new chairperson. That would be me. Um, all right. So we looked at two issues in our committee, our our, um, our meeting. Uh, the first was to update. Um, our forms to reflect current dates, if I am correct. Correct. I think that we didn't make any changes to the correct. proposal that you see before you on this board. It's basically just to update the, 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 our, our regulations to reflect the current dates of our forms. Seeing there are no questions about our legislative and budget committee report, do we have do we need a motion? Oh, yeah. Okay, so we need a motion to approve the report. Um, so we need, a, it's proposed regulatory language that the committee has brought forward to the board today. Um, the first one being the form updates. So you would need, for us to start the regulatory package on that, you would need a motion to approve that regula regulatory language. Okay. My chair, the chair of the committee. Um, I would like to move that we accept these um, uh, changes. Okay. Second. So Ms. Crabtree seconded. And then now we have some public comment. Yeah, Fred Jones, PBFC. So we're just talking about the first, the first item. Okay. Yes. This is regarding our forms. Okay, so if there's no additional public comment, we will call for a vote um, starting at my left. Coco Lachine, yes. Jackie Crabtree, yes. Andrew Drapkin, yes. Dr. Kerry Williams, yes. Rich Hedges, public member, yes. Lisa Tong, yes. Joseph Federico, yes. Holly Cordenas, yes. So the motion passes regarding our form. There's a second part, part B. So there was a second item we looked at. Um, I'll call it by the subject that's left here's definition of access. And of course, Christy will correct me if I'm wrong, but we made two changes mm -hmm. to the proposed items, which is on the back page of the item. Um, first, in the third line where it says ability, we changed that to authority. And then we crossed out, but not limited to, in the last line. So it would read, for the purposes of section 7313 of the Business Professionals Code concerning the Inspection of establishments, mobile units, and schools where barbering and cosmetology or electrolysis are being performed. Access means the authority of the executive officer and authorized representatives of the board to inspect all areas within the establishment, including all rooms, drawers, cabinets, rollabouts, and closets. And I will entertain a, um, a motion to um, approve these changes. So 
we have a motion on the floor and we will receive public comment. Hi, Fred Jones, Professional Beauty Federation, California. Um, so I'm having a tough time embracing the word all. Um, so after the authorized representatives of the board to inspect all areas within the establishment. Um, that's a pretty loaded term. So if an inspector goes into Jackie's personal office, which is in the establishment, and sees a lunch bell on her desk, do they have a right to demand access to her lunch bell or her briefcase or her locked um, file cabinet or, I mean, the list goes on and on. When you use the word all, you're claiming you have that authority. A sheriff wouldn't have that ability or authority um, without a very specific search warrant uh, to that end. So I'm concerned the word all is too all-encompassing. Um, there is the possibility of qualifying that all at the beginning of that section where it says where cosmetology services are being performed. Um, but I think for s to be clear, you may want to repeat that to inspect all areas within the establishment where such services are, be are being performed. Um, that's one option to limit the word all. May I ask a question? Absolutely, please. So a bathroom. Right. So these, most people would assume services are not being performed in the bathroom. Right. Are you saying we have no access to the bathroom where all the hidden stuff is hidden? Right. In fact, you have a regulation that says you can't use a bathroom for, for storage of products, etc. Well, how are you going to know that unless you go in the bathroom? Um, yes, so... I had another suggestion <laughs> in addition to the qualifying, reiterating where services are performed or believed to be related um, to services, products, or equipment, something like that. I just think the word all is going to get folks into some trouble. And my apologies, by the way, for not being there. So I really no appreciate the indulgence of the full board. I mean, we did consider all that, obviously. It's just, as we know, we know that they are hiding things and everything in the establishment. So it is a slippery slope either way, as we know, with legalities and, and rights. So I should hear what you're saying. And not, and not debating, because I don't think this is a debating session. But just to give my reasonings for this, um, I know that things are hidden because I find them. If I couldn't go into the break room, I probably wouldn't find the lidocaine after I found needles in the institution's room because um, I have found those things when I've been along with, with, a, with an inspector, uh, especially on revisits after someone has been uh, cited for having items that they're not even supposed to have on the premises. My guess is if you really wanted to use those, you would hide them in a place the board member or the board inspector couldn't go, which if we can't go into the office, they would be there. We know that, that crime seeks, seeks the lowest level in order to enter. So since we're not uh, investigating a crime, there's no real Fourth Amendment right because it's not an illegal search to look Right. Uh, if some th then if some prosecution that were a crime arrived from that, which we're not going to let happen, uh, then uh, then I could say that maybe we shouldn't be in there. But uh, in, in, in the absence of, of of a crime being involved with a with a search of an office, I don't see a problem personally. Well, and again, my you know me, <laughs> I'm not trying to debate art either. But let me give you a hypothetical. If you have more reach conduct searches in, without a warrant in an establishment than sworn law, law enforcement officials. It's possible sworn law enforcement officials could use your inspector's ability to search for other things unrelated to beauty services, products, etc. Um, and that's, that's, pardon me? <laughs> So we have internal policies 
as you probably recall, from a certain situation many years ago. I tried to keep it hypothetical. Established <laughs> us working with law enforcement. We were smacked yeah. So, but we have all that access right now. Didn't change it. We're not adding access. We only wanted to help clarify it for licensees that access included drawers because that's our biggest complaint. I get that. We have the access. We currently go into offices. We go. We don't go into personal belongings, and nobody should go in, be going into purses or lunch boxes. And the reason why I'm even talking about this, all of us in this room, including the public behind me, are very reasonable people. But there has been abuses by your inspectors, by the way. And there are some issues with your inspectors, as many people behind me would be happy <laughs> to testify about. So the more you can clarify the regulation to avoid potential pitfalls in the future, that's all I'm trying to do. And I'm just saying the word all is a very loaded term here, and it's hoping that we can somehow clarify. Can I ask a question? Just for, for, for clarity, are you saying you're objecting to the word all where it says inspect all areas? Correct. Or are you objecting to all rooms or both alls? No. Well. Because if I cross out inspect areas within the establishment, including all rooms, drawers, would you object to that too? Right. I think somewhere these two all terms need to reiterate that this is about beauty services, products, and equipment. That's the limit of the search. Um, and I'm not sure the first phrase, and you have two legal counsels here today, so I welcome <laughs> input from either or both. I'm not sure the first phrase where it talks about where barbering, cosmetology, or electrolysis is being performed appropriately qualifies those two alls. Um, in a practical sense, I don't know if my concern will ever bear its ugly head. I hope it doesn't. But. I have a question. Uh, my understanding is we have semi-annual meetings at least with the inspectors. Yeah, we, we meet every since the since the travel, uh, we had some problem with meeting with them based on the budget a few years ago, but we're back to doing that. Well, we have uh, we've had issues meeting with all of them at once, so instead we do unit meetings with each of them. Okay, so so these issues will be discussed with them, right? We haven't had any issues with this. No, but I'm saying that they'll it'll be made clear to them. Uh, what they can do and what they can't do. Absolutely. And I have faith that if they violate that, that the disciplinary process uh, will be enforced. Right. Okay. Um, Hi. Public Wendy, California Aesthetic Alliance. Um, we kind of walk a line with our client intake forms with regard to HIPAA violations and what we're allowed to ask them and things like that. Within your policy, and since we don't know what those are, are you allowed to access client records or scheduling data, online schedulers, any of that? No. We, we wouldn't, there's nothing in our regulations that say, that address that at all. Okay. So. We shouldn't be looking at any personal information. It's, it's no, of no relevance to us. The, we will look at appointment books because, unfortunately, we find so much unlicensed activity and individuals saying they haven't done anything. And if an inspector finds an appointment book for that individual where they've just done five uh, pedicures, we take a picture of that appointment book. OK. An appointment book also means like a digital scheduling database as well? To be. We, we can't... Because we're not all paper. We can't... I have personally never seen any digital... Uh, I mean, our inspectors can't sit down at a computer and require anybody to log into the computer. Uh, they us. have. Well, then let me know when. Because <laughs> yeah. some of the stuff yeah. that we've talked about before, yeah. we haven't proven anything. So okay. by all means, if you have examples, let me know. Yeah, I would be happy to do that. Um, so that would be my concern, is some of these um, where we keep our client files with regard to their personal and medical history. Um, we would want to make sure that those are safe from you know, being riffled through for whatever reasons. So that would be a consideration. And also um, inspectors looking at the um, desktop, uh, you know, the images on the computer screen and going through their electronic scheduling is also something that we would be concerned about. So as would I. So please let me know if you have any evidence of that. Certainly. Thank you. Is there any additional public comment at this time? So we do. I'll go ahead. 
I'm hearing some concerns about the language, and I don't know if this would be cumbersome in terms of adding mm -hmm. clarification in terms of the purpose of inspection. I don't know if it would help or address any of the concerns if we were to add on something along the lines of to inspect with the intention of you know, consumer protection or something along those lines. Uh, so I was considering that, but if you notice, actually, rather than tacking on at the end, your first sentence of that subsection addresses that. In other words, that specifically says this is for the purposes of your statute that talks about ex inspection of establishments, mobile units, and schools <clears throat> where these services are performed. So I think that that achieves the clarification that, that I think is being alluded to across the board. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we do have a current motion on the floor, and just so everybody can remember what that motion is, it's to adopt the updated language that was discussed in yesterday's um, enforcement meeting. And it, just to remind everyone, that is changing the word ability to authority and eliminating the phrase, but not limited to. Um, so that is the current motion on the floor to adopt that language. And now I will call for a vote, starting at my right. Holly Corden is yes. Joseph Federico, yes. Lisa Tong, yes. Rich Hedges, yes. Dr. Kerry Williams, yes. Andrew Drafton, yes. Jackie Crabtree, yes. Coco Lachine, yes. Okay, so the motion passes. And now we will move on to our item number nine, um, our licensing and examination committee report. And I will defer to our chair. Which is me again. <laughs> so yesterday we had licensing examination committee. Um, the primary uh, issue that we discussed in the license examination committee was uh, in regards to the personal service permit, which has been our charge to create some form of regulation around it. Um, our awesome staff brought us some proposed regulation, regulatory language for us to discuss, and from there it just devolved into issues that we've had, but the with some of this, uh, with some of these requirements, and with the personal service permit overall, um, one of the main things that I heard out of the uh, out of the enforcement committee hearing was that um, is a fear of how is this going to actually be um, put into world world real world use when this personal service permit comes about, considering that we can't even get um, our current inspection base off the ground and do our and do our regular inspections and now we're going to basically open up a whole new segment of inspections and how are these inspections going to go forward um, th uh, things that were tossed around yesterday was ideas of people who are do who would go after the personal service permit would um, maybe get some kind of additional education and we discussed looking at maybe the bloodborne pathogen certificate or something of that nature to kind of look at um, another one of the issues that we discussed yesterday, which when we originally talked about the personal service permit, I would say over a year ago, and it was down south, I can't remember the exact location, San was San Diego, was limiting it to a specific license type. And at that time, the discussion for the license type was to fall under maybe like natural mail services. Yesterday, the idea was thrown out, maybe we should go into the aesthetic side um, and then it was, uh, and uh, we had some kind of agreement on the board, like, yeah, maybe we should do the aesthetic side. And then it was brought up that waxing becomes a big issue when it's done at home. So what I ultimately um, requested, and I think where we went back to, is we suggested that rather than moving this personal service permit regulatory language uh, forward, is that we should have the staff go back and do a risk assessment of between license types and what kind of services would be best benefited um, under this personal service permit license or permit, I guess. And um, to come back, and then after they do the required work, to come back into the enforcement committee, is that the right committee? No, the licensing examination committee. To come back into the licensing examination committee and report on that, and then um, from there we can maybe start moving forward on some regulatory language. Um, did I miss anything, Christy? No, that's fine. All right. 
So that's what we discussed yesterday. So since we basically sent it back to staff, there is no reason to take uh, any formal um, formal motions. I just have one question on that, Christy. Um, can it can it be clarified on how many in this language how many um, personal service permits can be given to each brick and mortar that you're attaching that to in some of that language, so that we don't you know one brick and mortar doesn't have twenty. Um, personal service permits going on, and, and then when they leave, yeah, as well as when they leave this out establishment. Um, yeah, and then also I'd just like to say in regards to the uh, personal service permit and what came about yesterday in the meeting was that um, I made a statement towards the end that I feel that the state board needs to really start uh, looking ahead in regards to license types and um, that we should take some of this information and go into our strategic planning tomorrow in regards to license types because it seems far too often that uh, legislators are basically creating the bills and then we're being forced to react to them right. rather than us being ahead of the curve on this. And if California wishes to stay ahead of the curve in regards to, as we always take pride in, then it's, uh, it, it's important for us and our board of arbitrary cosmetology to understand kind of what is out there. Yes. So, I've had several concerns with this. Um, and I was just thinking this through. Um, there's no way we're going to be able to control this. I brought that up yesterday. The apps are out there. Uh, digital technology is disrupting a lot of industries and the regulations within those, those industries. And especially if you look at Uber, uh, where they seem to roll over the regulations and ignore them. Uh, where the regulations like on cab drivers are maintained and they work at a very disadvantaged situation where they actually have to pay to go into the airports and Uber wheels in. I've actually experienced it when picking up someone at the airport you can't find a place to pick them up because of the Uber uh, cars. So just giving that as an example, uh, we're probably not going to be able to control this whether it's licensed or not. But I would take a first step at it. I've been thinking that since our meeting last night, and maybe limit it to the office, someone's workplace, to begin with, see how that works. And I raised several issues yesterday. One of the issues I raised is very simply, and I think this will probably happen, that not everybody is honest. And uh, my police department has actually correlated people who've let magazine solicitors into their home with the amount of burglaries in the area where they were soliciting. So uh, this is an incident where somebody, maybe they have a clean record, but they have family and friends who don't, that they act as a lookout when they go into people's homes. We don't know that. Uh, we can't protect people from everything, but we can certainly do a trial where maybe we limit it to the office. And uh, the reason I'm saying that is I live in a mixed use area offices, restaurants around me, and I, and I know that uh, people come and set up in a parking lot and wash cars for the people in the office. Um, that, and I know that there are services going on in offices now for manicure and other, other cosmetology services. So maybe if we kept it out of the home as far as licensing, uh, and I know we're not going to discuss that today, but to have the staff think about doing it uh, by, by industry for a while, uh, going into the office rather than the home. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I agree that. I agree that this is probably, uh, uh, it's moving towards the direction about personal licenses, and uh, I just have a comment on I letter C where it says that maintain employment at a licensed establishment that does not have outstanding fines or disciplinary. Uh, that is bothersome to me because it's almost like punishing the applicant if the establishment has a case and it has not been resolved. Uh, so uh, that that is sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, concerning to me uh, if it's tied to exactly to the fines and or outstanding, you know, I, I, I don't have an answer, but I just, it just seems like we're kind of, especially if they're independent contractors. And, and Coco, I brought up some of the same concerns in the committee meeting yesterday, which is why we're not ready to formally yeah. bring forth any 
um, proposals to the board to vote on because we understood yesterday that there are a lot of things within the current proposal that need to be fleshed out, worked out, and that was definitely one of my concerns as well. Yeah, but I'm glad that we are sort of looking into it. Thank you. So, actually, thank you so much. It's really good because when somebody's got something in the field, I'm not sure we can limit them legally until that field is resolved. I'm sure we can limit them if they've got a very bad record, and we should, probably should. But uh, uh, there are brighter minds in mind, and I'm sure our, our uh, attorney here, or I think we have at least one competent attorney in the audience that could enlighten us on our ability to uh, withhold licensing if someone's into a field. So because we don't have a, a formal proposal that requires a motion, um, should yeah, I still do the motion? Oh, so should I, I was going to ask, should I take public comment? No? Just move on? Okay, so that was just our update. Um, is there any additional comments from our board regarding this? Yes. I just want to say uh, the office thing is really a good idea because there would be more eyes, um, public eyes, um, watching, and, and um, you wouldn't have the one-on-one. -on -one. And so there wouldn't be as much of a safety issue for an individual if more people were witnessing, I guess. I agree. It just kind of creeps me out to have somebody go into a home. You don't know if whether the person in the home would be, you know, um, assaulting the licensee. the licensee or vice versa or what have you. But keeping it in a public place is a great idea, I think, and we really need to think about that. I just wanted to comment on that. Thank you. Great. I want to comment, too, just because I think the same thing as you, Polly, and I think this is just opening up so much liability and so much underground activity, and as we know. I mean, we're kind of stuck with it because of it got passed, but I think making it limited as much as we can and where it can be done and how many per salon and what brick and mortar to put on to and whatnot to change our language. May, may I also, without belaboring the point that Jackie made, but I totally agree that the same way that we're concerned about schools selling hours is that establishment selling access to get a permit. Right. Mm -hmm. So right. I would just, if I could, um, we had a discussion yesterday over this issue about how we would control it. And Right now, we have, what, seven positions open for people on leave from inspectors? Mm -hmm. uh, we have 22 inspectors, seven of them not active. Uh, we're not even counting sick leave and vacations. Uh, and we were told yesterday that we have notices out for hiring, but we can't get people to apply because of the wages. We haven't been able to solve that. We've been recommending for a while that we maybe do some kind of housing allowance because we can't get people in the LA area who live there or in the Bay Area. We actually are sending people in from the Bay Area. How, under those conditions, when we're expected to police this, will we not get a bad reputation as a board because we're not gonna be able to control it? So we've been given something that's almost impossible for us to oversee. Yeah, we're gonna do limited. That's as much point. as yeah. we possibly can. Um, I have a couple other points I want to raise. I believe we heard from our enforcement manager yesterday. Um, so as we are on hold to figure this out, the Attorney General's office is currently not, um, I think, making decisions on certain cases that may be related to this. And so I think we're in a problematic situation where we really need to uh, figure this out because we're not able to enforce um, certain situations that would apply were a personal service permit be made available. So, so I think this is very, very problematic. Um, and I'm wondering, I don't know if it would be at all useful to talk to some of the companies that we do know are moving forward with these types of services. I know that there are a few that have already popped up in California. I don't know if we've engaged in conversation with them to make known some of our concerns, but I think it might be beneficial for us to sit down with them as a board that is going to regulate. I know that many of these startups feel that they don't need to follow established regulations, um, but I think the effort should still be made 
um, to try to get ahead of some of these things so that they can at least include some of our concerns in their development since many of these startups are in kind of initial um, application development phases. So that's, a, that's something I would like to see the staff do. And just to um, echo what our enforcement manager said yesterday, um, there have been attempts to reach out to some of the current mm -hmm. apps, and they feel that since they're just facilitating the arrangement between the licensee and the individual, that they're just less likely to want to enforce it. They feel that it's the responsibility of the licensee to know. So we face a lot of issues, and also our enforcement manager did express how they have been working and trying to identify licensees on the apps, and because it's on a, I think she described it as a Robin Will, or um, like they just kind of circulate on who's available. It's just yeah. very, very difficult yeah. to just, oh, round Robin, yes. Mm -hmm. It's just very uh, difficult to pin down our licensees. So we're definitely a rock stuck in a hard place. Um, so I appreciate the update. Are, are there any additional comments from our board members? Okay, seeing none, we're going to move on to our next item on the agenda, and that is item number 10, um, which is um, discussion and action on proposed bills that could impact EDC. So I'm going to defer to Ms. Christy Underwood. Okay. Ready? <laughs> Uh, the first bill on the list is AB 326, which um, discusses the domestic violence and sexual assault awareness training, which the board did take a position on at our last meeting that we would support if amended, and um, we recommended that this be taken to more to the public health department. Um, this bill has been amended, not with that, though. <laughs> Um, so what it what it's now looking is it's restructured our health and safety advisory committee and included this as part of, the, of that committee's charge to um, look at the education for awareness of of this type of training and um, requires us to so basically update our health and safety curriculum as well as do a pilot testing program for instructors to do this via uh, one hour course, correct? Mm -hmm. um, so it actually in provides a pretty significant fiscal impact to the way this is currently written because we would have to um, provide training. We would that would cost you know staff to, for us to do this as well and locations. Um, it's going to require regulation packages. It would require a complete update of our health and safety curriculum that was just completed um, a month ago. Mm -hmm. um, so right now we're looking at a total cost, fiscal analysis cost of um, you know close to twenty thousand dollars for us to implement this. We, we discussed yesterday that I attended a, a meeting with Jerry Hill where we were talking about uh, human trafficking. We were really focused on that on the peninsula. It was a countywide meeting, and uh, I told you that, just in reflecting, that Jerry had actually mentioned attaching human trafficking uh, to this bill as well. Um, and I told you yesterday that my major concern, besides the fiscal impact, is at some juncture down the road, our licensees will be treated like nurses and school teachers, where they're required notice the authorities and can lose their license if they don't. And I think it's really a slippery slope for our people because they try to have a relationship with the people that they're working on and would be likely not to want to get in the middle of something like that. So I'm just concerned not so much about this bill or the physical impact, but what may come after it. Because as we well know, once something's in place, it gets refined. I would also have to say that, you know, the cost on that when, I mean, I would think it would be better to put that money towards a better salary for the, to hire more inspectors. <laughs> so can, let me ask, if I could, yes. ask our director a question. Uh, so since we've already taken a position on this, we can leave our position as it was. You can leave your position, make a new position. No, I, I don't feel different. Is the oh, and it also doesn't address apprentices. So that's a concern of ours that we have no mention that any of this training would ever get to our apprentice program. And then how is the education? 
And then Tammy has also found that, yeah, go ahead. At our last meeting, um, a member brought up about maybe uh, handing it off to public health to further. So I got on public health's um, website, and they do, they have an initiative, Violence in California program, that um, they already have in place that refers it back and forth to public health and CDC. So they are being funded to provide training in this area. They have the resources and actually most of it in place already. So we may want to jazz up our, our position to include this? Right. We, we had recommended, you know, our position in the past was supportive amended, and really we thought that the Department of Public Health should be the leader of this, not necessarily the Board of Barbering and Cosmetology. Yeah. Right. Um, yes. This is, you know, I, I'm not sure how this might fit in. However, uh, I know that as a uh, as a uh, establishment owner or you know someone who runs an establishment, uh, even including my business, that we're required by law to provide employees with sexual harassment pamphlets, and I'm not sure, and, and that's a state requirement. I'm not sure who puts that pamphlet out, but we're required to give it out. And could we look into the agency that provides that, and maybe they could include uh, sexual abuse stuff in that same pamphlet? I, I, I'm not sure. Because it's. I really think that it's not within our scope. It's just and we're not professionals in this area. <laughs> on, on a, I totally and completely agree. Um, we did get a section added to there that we could promote anything on our website about awareness because we don't have that authority right now, and we would have we would like to do that. We think our website already has a lot of information on workers' rights, and so why not? provide more information if it's out there, but we would need the statutory authority to do that. So they did put that in the bill as well, um, allowing us to promote awareness of, of these, these issues. Right, exactly. Ignoring the issue itself, because I think last time I've expressed my opinions on this, the fiscal impact. Is there a way to phrase that? Uh, I guess we still wouldn't support if amended, if even if they included the money, that that it would cost us. But is there any way to at least some? I mean, we could say that, but I don't think if they said, "All right, here's the eighteen thousand dollars to cover it," we wouldn't necessarily support it because there are the other issues right. that we we did it. So, but is there a way to? somehow also request that to the suggest at least suggest to the authors if this does go through this is going to be a nice little chunk out of our budget can we get some costs to cover these changes kind of a thing well what would happen in that process is we would do a fiscal impact we would submit that fiscal impact and and basically what's called a budget change proposal that goes through the Department of Finance. The Department of Finance would look at our budget, which is quite healthy, and would say, you can absorb it. Because technically, we could. $20,000. Translated. Right. Okay. So we've been dealing with unfunded mandates since the <laughs> war. Are there any additional questions about um, the current? I believe we need a motion, correct? Any additional questions? We do need a motion even though. Uh, position. What, or do you want to maintain our current position? Yeah, to, I to still to maintain our current position. Let it be amended. Do we even need to make a motion to maintain the current position or can we just move forward? We already have something in place. Right. We just didn't. Yeah, just make a Okay, so we're just going to maintain our current position. Okay. So the next um, bill is A, B. 
So 1099 is the bill that is the payment of a gratuity um, that requires if you pay by, if you allow somebody to pay for services by credit card, you also have to allow a tip to be placed on that credit card. And defines entity. And defines, it made some changes to define an entity. And the board took a position on this as, as I watch last time. And I don't believe there's been any changes since other than the entity. Right, which excludes us. So, so entity now is an organization, as defined in the bill, is an organization that uses an online enable application or platform to connect workers with customers to engage in the workers to provide the labor services. And the example of that is like a Lyft, a Lyft app. So they had amended out the specific part that says Board of Barbering and Cosmetology. So we're no longer on the hook for this one. So we can still watch it. My guess is that this was actually directed at the There's been a lot of consternation in the area about not allowing tips to be exposed. And uh, there's a lot of public sentiment. And the group was already clenched on not allowing tips. Yeah, it's starting today in Sacramento. <laughs> <laughs> I was told by my Uber driver <laughs> to remind me that now you can. There's been a change in the running of the company, too. Mm -hmm. So, for this particular bill, are we maintaining our watch position? Yes, uh, unless uh, there's a motion to do unless something there's else. A different motion? Okay, so we're all in agreement we're just going to maintain our current position. So, we'll move on to the next bill, 1516. Uh, so, AB 1516 is. A very basic bill. I don't believe that you've seen this one last time. It is it is just a technical cleanup in um, not our law, but it's regarding the Healthy Nell recognition program. And you can see by the language of the bill that it's basically just reworded the, the commencing with the section 977 of our regulations. So it's just a technical cleanup for the language that was presented last year in the bill. Okay. Okay. The next bill is AB 1575, which does not impact our board, but it basically impacts our licensees. This is the cosmetic ingredient label bill, um, and it's basically a requirement for manufacturers to, per to include ingredients on their products. It doesn't necessarily impact us. We have, we have no jurisdiction over it at all, but we thought it was an important bill. Let me just by example explain how it will impact the whole country. The state of California initiated a law about 10 years ago that uh, on all meat products coming into the country, it had to have the country of origin. My cousin in Kansas called me and said, we have a meat packing plant here, and when I went to the store, they have meat coming in from another country. And I said, you've just been Californiaized. The only reason you know that is because of California. So when we pass something like this, we're so large, the fifth largest economy in the world. To give you an example, Russia is the ninth largest economy in the world. That It impacts the rest of the country because when the manufacturers have to change it for us, the good work that we do helps consumers in other parts of the country. So I'm in favor. This is something actually that my union started in the late 80s and early 90s. We actually did a study on this and that and, and the unhealthy ingredients of the many cosmetics. So I feel really charged about this. It's finally coming to the forefront. Can I just bring up too, in defining professional, they have inadvertently left off our electrology licensees. They list out cosmetology, barber, aesthetics, but we're missing our electrology so we licenses. Ask for an amendment. We need a motion for this. What, I have a the couple questions. Oh. Yes. What are they defined as a professional cosmetic manu like manufacturer? I was trying to find that. I'm just saying. I'm just wondering if someone like you know in a salon who makes their like that's kind of like one of the newer things is making your own like, go like cosmetic blends. Would they be required to fall under the statute or like their own? 
so they would be required to like list an ingredient or is there like a so everything that's defined under professional cosmetic it's a cosmetic that's defined in the section of law that's intended to be marketed to professionals only so so if they were a so if like it's if, so if a stylist is basically making their own like uh, moisturizer or something like that would they be required that they then sell to their client base would they be required then to have an ingredient list it's only if you buy a professional it's only something else it's only if you buy a professional I don't think you can sell this customer to use a but if they, but then yeah, if they sell it, but if they utilize it in their own salon, they're being they're they're professional. That people. could that probably is in a different section of law. Okay, I just say I just don't want to like. Could be, I don't right, want to require yeah. undue uh, undue burden on like on some of our professionals. Like if they're if we can be able to have some, you know what I'm I saying. I mean, there might be some regulations already in place yeah. for that that we don't know about. Okay. So whatever we do with this, we need to include. <laughs> Did you say it was the electrologist? Yes. Mm -hmm. The electrologist. So do we need we need probably need to state that clearly so that not just say all of our. So if I were going to form a motion on this, would be in support of the bill if they include the the electrologist as well as all other professionals within our industry. So if that's a motion, does anybody want to second second it? Support it from Okay. Can we state that please? Um, uh, we support if amended to include all segments, all professionals with that we license, including the uh, the electrologist. Okay. okay. Okay, so we currently have a motion on the floor. We're gonna open up for public comment. Jamie Schraubeck, Precision Nails. It doesn't seem that this law as proposed takes into account that many of our products come in containers that are so small that that kind of labeling isn't going to fit. It would have to be like on a separate tear sheet or maybe if you were buying that product in bulk quantities and then transferring it to smaller containers, which is something as a manicure we do all the time, particularly with our gel products, because we're working from smaller pots that we are labeling ourselves uh, but we certainly aren't labeling them with all of the ingredients. Thank you. It says uh, on a schedule in an electronic or other format as determined. Uh, Wendy, California Aesthetic Alliance. I think that what you were bringing up is a lot of our aesthetic products in the back bar um, uh, do not have any sort of ingredients on them. You see a 2% lactic on the front. They're usually uh, modified, simplified printing, um, kind of generic looking. Um, so we don't include those on larger bottles. I can see Jamie's point of having to list all that stuff on a little tiny nail bottle and having that available. But also, I don't know how this would affect um, many estheticians do private label their products. And I don't know that this incorporates that. Sometimes they private label for their own use in back bar, but also they retail those as well. So I don't know um, what the requirements are, as Christy mentioned, um, for the whole thing included. So that would be my question is how will this affect our back bar versus our retail and our private label? Is there any additional public comment? Okay, seeing none, I'm now going to take a vote starting at my right. Presentation to vote is just simply to add the to amend, to the add our but, it's the, the, but the position is um, a support, support, support if amended. That's Richard's motion is yes. to support if amended oh. and add electrologists. Who said he is it? I did. Yeah. Okay. Lisa Tong, yes. Just Federico abstain. Lisa Tong, yes. Rich Hedges, yes. Dr. Carrie Williams, yes. Andrew Drafton, yes. Jackie Crabtree, yes. Coco Lachine, abstain. Okay, so we have a majority vote that passes. 
And now we will transition to the next one. The next bill is SB 247, which was the deregulation of the barbering license and removal of the application of makeup from the specialty branch of skincare. This bill has basically stalled. However, we want to keep it on here just, just in case. Um, but the board has already taken a position of oppose on this bill, and the bill is not moving through the process. So it's just kind of an update for you. He hasn't like pulled, they haven't pulled the bill yet. It's just, but it's just not moving. Anymore. It's just right. what we call dead. <laughs> no, it's a technical term. It's a two-year bill. It is a two-year bill. If it makes it anywhere. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we'll move on. SB 296 is the bill we talked about earlier, creating the task force. This is Senator Wynn's bill for the manicuring scope of practice. Um, so the board currently has a position of opposed, um, but we are obviously earlier created the task force, and this is a two-year bill as well. Okay. So do we currently have any um, additional comments from the board? Want to maintain our current position? Yes. All right. We'll move on. SB 490 is a bill. I don't think we've seen this before. We have not seen this bill before, and this bill is on commission wages for employees licensed under the Barbering and Cosmetology Act. Um, this bill allows BBC licensees to be paid a commission wage if the salon pays twice the minimum wage base hour. Like I'm not making sense. It's complicated. It's very complicated. <laughs> um, so we're so since this is the commission bill, it doesn't necessarily impact our board. We will not have any impact other than we would be required to um, update our training course. So there's a small minimal impact on that. Um, and we have not taken a position on this bill. Do you want to add anything? Not really. It's a very complicated issue. Basically, um, it allows a commission to be negotiated if they pay twice the minimum wage amount. So when all the minimum wage tops out, it will be $30 an hour plus a negotiated commission rate on top of that. It doesn't negate um, piece rate wage if they want to follow the other um, Requirements they can, but it offers this in addition to that. So it was in response to the piece right wage, yes. but it was it was, it was formed as home, hopefully a car like for people who didn't want to participate. Exactly. It was put on by PBA, and it was a carve out so that the commission based salons had another alternative than paying the piece rate for um, break time being at a higher rate as well because of the farming industry. Mm -hmm. So it really impacted um, our industry hugely, but it doesn't obviously affect the consumer safety. Right. right. Okay. So it's up to the board if you want to take a position on this bill. It doesn't impact our operations, but. Yeah. We're not going to take a position? Just out of curiosity, where is the standing of this bill? This bill has moved, moved to the assembly. To the assembly, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Right. Um, it's been in the assembly. It's on its third reading as of our last. So moving on then to our next bill, SB 547. Um, there has not been a change to this bill, and the board currently supports this bill. It is the bill that we clarified, just some apprentice supervision language, um, <coughs> which I'm personally very happy about. <laughs> OK, so do we want to maintain our current position on this bill? Yes? OK, so we're maintaining our current position. Its status is in the assembly too. I believe so. Yes. 
and that is with the um, Assembly Appropriations Committee. Last is SB 715, which we have not taken a position on. This bill adds failure to attend board, meet, board meetings to the justification for removal of an appointed board member by the governor. When I was listening to the hearing, they brought up um, being conscious and exercising, um, you know, a measure of consideration to things that I think that they were mainly concerned with in the hearing anyway, um, people just not showing up and performing their duties. Right. Must have missed at least three or anything like that. So I missed one. They can say. No. Does this apply only to the appointments made by the governor or any? I asked that same question and it was not clarified. It says because, governor I mean, appointed. Some of us are not appointed by the uh, governor. Oh no, any yeah, member, says, yeah. any um, member of any of any board. Any so. member of any board appointed by him or her. That, how's that doing? So the governor has the... Yes, governor appointees. Okay. Sister, yeah, because I imagine this, the two people that are going to control that legislation would like it to be right. overridden. So you're, you're talking about the president <coughs> and the Senate yeah. and the Speaker. So, but this, does this give the authority, like, so... Wait, I'm trying to do the math here. In January, 19, you know, 2019, will have a new governor. God forbid I miss our January meeting. That new governor could get rid of me within my, my appointed term and I'll start. So he could use this to clean house from the previous governor, whether a party party or intra party or anything like that. The governor could just. Well, to be theory. honest, is it, no. that, okay, that's what I was going to okay. say. Okay. Part of the yeah, you serve at the pleasure of the governor, governor. and we have seen, I have seen in the past the governors. What's, if you serve at the pleasure of the governor, what's the purpose of this then? They're just including the neglect of duties to include missing board meetings. Right. Okay. So we must take a position on this? You don't have to. So, so that tells me that if somebody continually comes to meeting, doesn't do their packets, doesn't make comment, that gives the governor the authority to Probably depends on the Under the seven steps of, of, of <laughs> just cause, it's a verbal and a, and a written and then a suspension and a it firing. Depends on your relationship with Mona. <laughs> Richard, this, this is not the DRC committee right now. <laughs> so, I, I guess they expect you to figure that out during the board the board, uh, uh, the board introduction that you have to go through. Yeah. So, board members, do you want to take a position? No. Okay. All right. We're going to stay out of it. <laughs> okay. So, now we're going to move on to the next item on the agenda, which is item number 11, our proposed regulations. And we're going to get some status updates from our executive director. So, you'll be happy to hear that this is just a status update. So, I don't need a motion on anything. Hooray. <laughs> Um, section uh, 904 and 905, which is our health and safety poster, we did our 15-day comment period and no comments were received. And so that is um, going through our review through the Department of Consumer Affairs. And then we have several other packages, the transfer of credit for training, the, the National um, Interstate Cancel Translation Guides, Administrative Fine Schedule, Citations of establishments and individuals for the same violation, the installment of payment plans for fines, and some uh, health and safety updates. Those, all of those regulations are with the Department of Consumer Affairs for their preliminary review, um, and then they will continue through the rulemaking process. So everything that you have voted on is going through the required processes. Awesome. Thank you so much, Christine.
Now we'll move on to our next item on the agenda. Item number 12, agenda items for the next meeting. Can I make a quick comment before we, um, something that I neglected to mention earlier. Um, I was going to say under the executive officer's report for DRC in August, we already miss Richard because we are very short staffed um, in our DRC. So if we have any members that are willing to take a trip to the beautiful city of Riverside, California, we could Hang use you. And those dates are August 21st so through the 23rd. And 23rd. As long as we're back on DRC, I'm asking for a full activity. So, that's my plea. Yes, and mine. Can't have Dr. Carey do it all by herself. <laughs> Monday, so Monday you're there. So Monday is covered. Tuesday, Tuesday Wednesday. And Leah, yeah, Tuesday, I mean, but if, if you want to do Monday also, we could always, it's always better with three than. For some reason, it's sick or can't make it. Right. Or just don't care. Or pastor Houston. Okay. Thank you so much. So now we'll go on to item number 12. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So I just wanted to go back to the DRC. The DRC, we've made not only community, but also educational. We really strive to give people to wait afterwards and go over everything with the staff. We explain to them in the time allotted as much as we can, but then we have them wait and go over the regulations to discuss uh, how they can better do the things they need to do. Mr. Hedges, if I may interrupt, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm concerned about where this is agendized. We're so, back under the DRC. Right. When you say back under, I wonder what you're referring to, because we had a regulation that spoke to the DRC, and we had a... Oh. I saw that statistics. I mean, if you're speaking to statistics, Update. that's the EO's report. All right, just, just checking that you're on agenda and that you're okay. comfortably within DRC statistics. That's actually the EO's report. So I'm hopeful that what we've done with the DRC continues. You can see uh, by looking how many cases we heard last year in Southern California and Northern California. But I've given you all a memo that was provided uh, from the state legislature in 2003, I believe it was, which outlines the number of deaths from pedicure infections and why AB 409 was enacted. These problems happened under the old uh, department rather than the board, but the board was ta tasked with solving them. To a great extent, they have been solved. Thanks to Governor Schwarzenegger, uh, the author of 409, and uh, our staff. So I would like to make sure, or at least I'm hopeful, that the kinds of reforms that we've instituted will continue, that the public will be safe, and that the DRC remains not only, not only a community, but an educational avenue for people. And I would say, Closing that, even though we ask people to do it, I'd say probably more than half don't wait to get a tutorial, even though we need it badly. So, uh, and we had that same experience when I first got on the board, because the department actually waived fines if you took classes, and then if you didn't take the class, it came back to DRC, and we were inundated with classes that came back to DRC with people who didn't take the classes who had waived fines. So. I'm saying that, I wish you all well, and I hope that uh, you do well in the future, and uh, I'm going to stay in touch. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. So we are on item number 12. Um, are there any agenda items that board members would like to see for the next meeting? May I, may I just make a comment? Uh, I'm not sure the procedure. I serve on another board in the city of West Hollywood, and in our agenda, there's always a line item for uh, members' comment, meaning members of the board, on things that may not be on uh, in the agenda, and they're just comments, so you cannot do any 
action on it. They're just comments. Is that something that is common with this type of boards? Yeah, it just depends. The closest uh, you have today is item two with the board president's opening remarks, but depending on how that is framed, oftentimes it might say um, board members' introductory remarks or things of that nature, so it just depends on how you want to attend it. Right, that's what, you know, like uh, even the city council of the city of West Hollywood has that also, and they have it in the beginning and the end, and I'm not suggesting we do both, I'm just suggesting maybe, uh, you know, and some members may not have any comment, but that would have been a good place for Richard to make his comment as well. So every other board I sit on, and I sit on a number of other boards, two transportation boards have that. Yeah. I agree. I think the key um, the key note is the fact that no uh, action could be taken at that point because it's They're not just clarified. Here. So I think there was a movement away from some of that, at least with DCA boards, for that reason, just to make it more clear that no action. Was but depending on how you clarify in your agenda, that could be included. Okay. So great. I'd like to suggest that if we. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, are there any additional um, agenda items you would like to see at the next meeting? Okay. Seeing none, we will move on to item Actually, number third. Oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> um, this is more of a question, and I don't know if it's something that we can include in uh, maybe the executive officer's report. Um, I had a question about how our consumer complaint and harm numbers compare currently to when, um, just historically, in terms of when we, how we were enforcing differently, because I do believe there, there was a time when we did not find, um, since I'm a more recent board member, it would be helpful to understand how we've improved. Okay, we've always fine, just so you know. Okay. We, find, we used to actually find a lot more than we do now, but I think definitely think there's some, um, kind of like we're doing with the exam stats, kind of giving more of an overview of the last few years, I think we could do the same thing with complaints and our enforcement activity. It's something we report for Sunset anyways, so I think, I think that's definitely something we could work on doing. Uh, if I could clarify just a bit, uh, under the old fine schedule when I got on, there were actually fines that were way right. intended classes uh, and not always had to attend but usually did and it just didn't work right it was a bureaucratic nightmare trying to keep up with it and people just didn't do it we could put together some information like kind of a history of it for the next board meeting yeah that would be helpful because I, I don't remember what I was looking at but it looked like there was an increase in like pedicure infections uh-huh so in the past like between 2015 and 2016 uh-huh so I'm just curious to see what that might have been added <coughs> with or if we have reasons for that. Just being able to see the data might be okay. helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Wait, I want to add on to that one. <laughs> Is it possible also to look at, like, basically um, overall, like, inspection reports reported versus inspection reports that culminated in a, um, in, um, a DRC hearing? Does that, does that make sense? I will tell you that. Well, no, like so. How many? How many inspection reports? How many yeah. times the inspector goes out and, uh, and issues a report, versus how many of those inspection reports that ended up like, in appeal? And ended up in appeal, yeah. and then yeah, that that was kind of my question. Then, then kind of like I you know, wanted to see if I could dive down into the appeal numbers. Where how many of those in appeal? Then how many of the appeal were basically affirmed? And then how many of those went to the next step? Which, uh, that, that, yep, we can do that. Yeah. Sorry. All right, thank you. Um, Go ahead. Yeah. Did, you, did you want that by inspector, or you didn't care about I don't inspector. care about inspector. I care until about total numbers, maybe. I actually, broken down my inspector would oh. be a good idea, too. There you go. Um, as we'll discuss, though, how we would yeah. portray that publicly. <laughs> yes, totally. And I... I think there's a lot we could do. I might even need good information. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, we, Carrie Harris, um, and I will call out one of our newer employees, Joseph Hefner. Hi, Joseph. Is our new stat guru. So um, he can do, between him and Carrie, they make magic happen. So. <laughs> you know what, for NASA? <laughs> he should. Don't tell NASA about him. <laughs> I stole you from NASA. <laughs> 
<laughs> Sometimes we think we did. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. So any additional, yes? Um, I have a question. It's going way back to the beginning here with the, um, the Spanish or um, how do they do it? Yeah. Hispanic um, pass fail. Um, and you were talking about grammar. Um, is there any way that we can offer the test, say, via headphones verbally, so they can auto, you know, audibly, I can't even talk. So they can listen to the test instead of having to read it. So maybe if it's verbally. So we do have certain accommodations that we can offer. I don't believe they can listen to the test. Um, some, some people have to have readers, for example, but they do have to provide um, justification for that. And justification is not usually because we offer it in Spanish. Um, so no, that, that's not something that we would be, that we would have available to do. I'm just thinking that you know, sometimes if it was verbally, you know, they might understand better than reading it themselves. I know DMV, if you're a non-reader, um, they will verbally give you the test and you can, but it's a one-on-one -on -one thing. So, mm -hmm. and I, I totally get that there's so many taking the test at a time. Right. So it's very difficult, but if we could look into some way of helping well what what we need to address is students are being allowed into schools that do not meet the minimum requirements that they should have been enrolled in school in the first place that is unfortunately out of our jurisdiction however it is a discussion that we will be having with the department and our new director um, when I when I meet with him directly Okay, so are there any additional questions um, or items that you would like to see on the agenda for our next meeting? Okay, seeing that now I will transition to item number 13, our public comment. Jamie Schraubeck, Precision Nails. As you're trying to balance the mandate to protect consumers with the pressures that you're facing to lower the barrier to entry to our industry through licensure, I would ask that, uh, this is on the heels of what Joseph talked about earlier, um, looking forward to what other um, organizations are coming up with, which would include changing the licensing categories and looking at the possibility of creating, for example, a 1,000 hour hairstyling only license and breaking this down. I think perhaps coming up with a waxing only license would be a way to reconcile what SB 296 is trying to achieve without creating the, the confusion of mixing licensing types. For example, in that case, it would be between manicuring and what estheticians and cosmetologists are allowed to do now with their waxing education. Um, the other point I'd like to make is that along with these pressures, you have the reality that, in fact, the schools that you do not have control over and who are admitting people who are not minimally qualified are then cheating those same people by selling them hours and cheating us as licensees and the consumers of the state of California because you are in fact then, and I hate to use that word, complicit in facilitating their entry into our industry because you are having to accept proof of training that's not real, that's not valid. And because you don't have the authority to control that side of our industry, essentially the initial um, entry of those licensees through their beauty school experience, we are now like awash with licensees whose license reads just the same as mine, but who haven't done the study, who've not passed the test in the same way that I did 25 years ago. And in fact, you, know, you mentioned the um, closing of the Marinello schools. I have had to, as an employer, terminate an employee who I found obtained their license through the purchase of ours. 
And I had another, I have another employee now who attended the same school and witnessed the selling of ours. And working with that student, we were able to report that to the local school district and then to the federal education authorities because that school was accepting federal ROP dollars based on false enrollment numbers. And they were clocking people in and out who weren't showing up. And they, their enrollment showed maybe 90 people. And yet when you'd walk in, there'd only be 20 people on site at a given time. So some people were following the rules, but the leadership was not, and that school is, is long gone. But again, I just want to enforce that um, it's really difficult in this competitive industry to compete against all of that, and we're handicapped from the very beginning um, with these um, unfortunate situations. So thank you. Thank you. I just saw a headline. I haven't read the article yet. I'm trying to remember. I get so many different newspapers emailed to me, it's either the Chicago Tribune or the LA Times, that uh, the Trump administration is trying to curtail what California is doing and going after the private schools. So I can't give you the details on that, but there is a headline out there and we all might want to search for that and find out what's going on because it will affect us too on this board if that happens. Is there any additional public comment? Okay, seeing none at this time, I will officially adjourn the meeting. Thank you so much.